So, on today's Legendary Anglers section, we are lucky enough to have our very own local legend himself, Mr. Julian Cundiff. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. The, the, the only benefit of getting old is you become legend. <laughs> <laughs> One way or another. Oh, thanks, guys. Lovely to see you. Oh, Merry Christmas, sir. Yeah, yeah, box. Here we are, day after Boxing Day. Absolutely. It, and, you know, it makes me laugh because as a kid growing up, people like Tim Paisley taught me work ethic. And like, I hear some people talking about work now in the fishing industry, I think, you, you honestly have no idea how hard we used to have to work before the days of social media. Yeah, so yeah, today, yeah. I know it's the day after Boxing Day, but I've got obviously this to do, and I've got, funny enough, Tim Paisley's fourth interview for Carpology. So like me and Tim, I mean Tim's in his 80s and I'm, I'm late 50s, so it never stops. <laughs> if you make a career of it, it never stops. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get to that point. Well, we will, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I think what we decided we were going to talk about is some local fishing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Um, which we have, we've, got some, uh, we've got some good local waters, um, yeah. and I know you personally have had a chance to fish most of them. Yeah. Uh, so... I guess our first question for you is, what's your favourite and why? If we're talking locally, if we're talking locally, I suppose my favourite would be Drax Pond, you yeah. know. Um, Drax Pond was the first water I ever fished in 1976, when I didn't even know about fishing. I've said it many times on podcasts about cycling on my bike, seeing an old guy, and that old guy was younger than I am nowadays <laughs> by quite a bit, and I always think now, before I start calling people old, I think, wow, <laughs> think back some, um, so that was my, yeah, I know my first water fish was 1976, I did catch carp from other waters, probably by accident, specialist angling, but that's where I learnt my carp fishing, so Drax Pond will always be, um, it's like your first car, yeah. you know, my first car was a Ford Escort in 1980 something, now I've had cars that are ten times better, but nothing beats that first car. Yeah, that was your first that, love affair. Yeah, that was my first, yeah, your first love, isn't it? Your first yeah. love. No matter who you are with now, your first love is, it's difficult to put it to one side. So Drax, to me, would be my favourite water um, for that, because it was my first water I ever fished. So I suppose, uh, just on the tail end of that then, is uh, how old were you when you first fished it then? Um, I was, it was 1976, so I was 13. So oh. th I was 13 years of age, I would be about 13 when I saw the guy fishing um, and I started fishing a month later. So yeah, I'll be 13, yeah. It'd be May 1976 I saw him fishing and looking at my pictures, it'd be June, July when I got my first rod from Woolworths. From Woolworths? From Woolworths, oh, from Woolworths had um, a separate fishing um, department called Winfield. So sort of like Winfield was the sporting department. So I got a six foot solid glass tokas rod, a little intrepid black prince, um, a Devon minnow spinner, spinning for perch. So that was oh, so that was my first fishing. So that was yeah that was that was that was what twenty four but I mean that was forty six years ago. Yeah. So I've heard of a predator angler before. Yeah I was I was always a predator angler um, before I was ever a carp angler. Yeah. I was I was a coarse angler match angler briefly, specialist angler and then carp angler. Yeah, we all start off on smaller stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it's the best yeah, one. No. To, I still like me match <laughs> angler. <laughs> the bit after the best anglers are match anglers. I've never been competitive, so match angling didn't work for me. Yeah. I understand how good they are, but fishing has never been a competition for me. Yeah. And Unless you are competitive, you will never. You don't matter how skillful you are. If you are, you, you have to be ultra competitive to be a match angler. It has to matter to win, and it it, it don't really matter to me at all. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it's more of a downtime, uh, relaxing hobby, isn't it? That, yeah, that, for that, me. that 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 has got grown on us all, I suppose. Yeah, I, it has to be what I want to do, and I don't. The thing with match fishing as a kid, I started with course angling. I knew you were course fishing that if you fish for tench in May, June and July at four in the morning to late in the morning, that was the best time to catch tench. But when you have matches, and you knew which peg to fish, when you have matches and they were drawn at eight and you start fishing at nine, the best time's gone. I'm in a swim I don't particularly want to be in. Yeah. And unless you, unless the aim of the game is to beat other people to win, I, I, th I thought it was the most boring thing in the world. Know, it was just, for me, but I, 
recognise, you know, my friends like Tommy Pickering, the skill of them. Tommy is, I would say, first and foremost competitive and secondly an angler. I don't mean that disrespectfully, but it's about winning for Tommy. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. he will fish anywhere at any time for anything if there's a competition. He needs competition yeah. to survive. Uh, no, again, no disrespect. I don't think Tommy just goes fishing. He he has to. He, that's what drives him. Competition. He'll be. We laughed about it. He said, "I'll be 80 and I'll still be like looking for the over 80s wheelchair sign <laughs> assisted carer <laughs> match." You know, that's what drives Tommy. And he's another local man as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 very much so. Yeah. I suppose this is something that I, I'm particularly intrigued after reading yeah. the BK Guide. That was the first book I actually got yeah. of yours from yeah. Tackle and Bait, funnily enough. All oh, right, yeah, oh yeah, uh, sign it. Probably local sign. tackle shop. Uh, give them a shout out, Fishing Tackle and Bait in Doncaster. <laughs> Absolutely great shop, and the prices. I mean, I don't buy much fishing tackle, but now and again I do buy fishing tackle because sometimes it's easier to buy it than order it or whatever and they're always you physically sitting your own yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean yeah. i don't like spending money <laughs> being a yorkshire but <laughs> even i don't mind spending money there great tackle shop it is yeah, definitely yeah, that's really good um but one one of the interesting things that I've, uh, you know that i suppose spoke to me a little bit was when you were talking about you know, you used to be a barrister. No, I used to be a, a legal advisor, which is like a solicitor for the court, yeah. There you go. Uh, the, the bloke at the front who runs the court. So oh. you you fully know, like most anglers, trying to fish around your work life as well, which is not easy, is it? <laughs> no, no, that was, re that was really difficult because I started fishing in the 70s, got a job as an admin assistant in, the, in 1980, August 80. And in those days, it wasn't too bad because it was nine to five, no responsibilities. Um, and you do a bit of course fishing after work, that was no problem. But when the carp fishing bug hit me in 86, all of a sudden you realise that most carp bit at nights, as we used to think. And I, it was like a wake up moment, I thought, well, I go every weekend and I'll go Fridays to Sundays religiously, which wasn't good for keeping a girlfriend. <laughs> <Absolutely, yeah. laughs> That's something else you, you put in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> that is like, you know. My mum would say, oh, and then I'd say, oh, you're not with her anymore. So I said, oh, funny enough, mum. In fact, I went fishing 40, 40 <laughs> weekends a year. Didn't seem to impress her. So, um, you know, I realised, I thought, well, if they bite on Saturday, Friday night and Saturday night, why are they not going to bite in the middle of the week? So all of a sudden I saw, I, I didn't go fishing at weekends, and I would go Monday, I would do Sunday night into Monday, and then Wednesday into Thursday, overnighters. Uh, and I just caught more fish then because the fish at the weekend were more pressurised. You know, it's changed now. When I started doing overnighters in the mid-80s onwards, there was nobody doing overnighters. The only people doing nights midweek were people who got four days holiday. I was the only person doing overnighters in my local area, without doubt. And in, obviously you felt that were useful at the uh, time. And... It was useful because a lot of fish were being caught at night, but over the years, as fish get pressurised, they then start to change their feeding habits. And it's all right if they were biting between seven in the mor seven at night till six in the morning, but if they were biting any other time outside that, it was just a waste of time. It was just about going fishing. But I, I wouldn't swap it for anything because I couldn't really go fishing at any other time. Yes, I could go fishing at weekends, but that was, you know, it, it, all of a sudden, I don't want fishing to take over my life. I want, weekends were for motorbikes, gigs, girls, family meals, things like that, which I didn't want to not do. So, mm. yes, it did cost me fish. So, 50% of the fish it cost me, but I also got 50% by fishing more. So, it more than evened out of court. Most of my fish were on, on overnight. I would say from 1986 to 2015, I would say, in a year, 70 to 80 percent of my fish were caught on overnighters. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So that probably brings us into his next question. So a lot of anglers do have to revolve the fishing around the work, but that means that they're rolling up at venues that they've never fished before. Yeah. So if you were to go to a new water, yeah. what would your first approach be to try and get a fish in short succession? Well, the first thing is research. I'm yeah. not going to roll up. There is no. I mean, in the olden days, my days. There wasn't research, well there wasn't an internet as such. Research was reading 
which was generally out of date. Maybe a bit of somebody telling you stuff, but in those days, unless it was your mate, nobody told you anything. In those days, it was nobody. Unless it was your mate who actually fished there, you got no information. Nowadays, there is no excuse to go to any water that you know about without doing your research. So, to me, the first thing is research. I want to find, you know, a little bit about the history of the water. There's no point turning up at the water, this is a great water, and then turn up in February. Oh, it's a great water in June, but it's not a great winter water. Yeah. You know, you've got to pick the right water. The second thing is, if it's a lo if we're talking for local lads, and I would always visit the water first without the fishing tackle. Nothing, there's nothing worse than having to lug all your gear out, because I don't care how keen you are as an angler, when you've got all your gear with you, you want to be fishing. You don't want to be looking, you don't want to be walking yeah. around. So my advice to anybody who's fishing locally, certainly where it's within an hour, is spend at least one afternoon, or evening, morning or whatever, preferably when it's busy, sort of a Saturday. Don't point going midweek when there's nobody about because you don't have to learn anything. If I was going to a new water today, I would go on a Saturday, then I would see what people were doing, how pressurised it was. More than likely you're going to see a fish being caught. More anglers there, more likely to see it. So my first thing is research, visit it at least once. Yeah. Clearly if you're going down for two or three hours away, then you can't do that, but we're not talking about that fishing. So always visit it at least once and see what other people are doing. It gives you an idea as well of how big the water is, because when somebody says three acres, it could be three acres which is really long, yeah. or it could be a round pool, and you know, that, that the first thing is that. The second thing is you want to take stuff that you're confident in. If it's a water where, say Lindome, Loco, you know that that is tons of their fishery pellets going in. Yeah. There is no point, I mean actually you have to use their pellets anyway, but being, being, there's no point going against the grain there. Yeah. You know, there absolutely is no point. So on waters which are saturated with one kind of bait, to me, the obvious thing is to get a bite is to go in with a going bait. Match the hatch. Yeah, match the yeah. hatch. So I would be using pellets. I would be using an imitation pellet on, on the hair. I mean, I can use boilies there, but I'd be using a dark one. I would be duplicating what everybody else is doing. So there's two ways of catching carp. You either do something different, and that's, that's very easy to say, but everybody talks about doing something different. But the majority of people who do something different, they often blank. It's right doing something different when nothing's getting caught, but if everybody's catching them on X, Y, and Z, doing something different is pointless if you want to get by. Don't yeah. think something that in bro. Don't think something in bro. So do it better. Yeah. So if you're going to a, a water, so if you're quieter, if your hook's sharper, if you're more of an accurate caster, if you're there before everybody else. So it's, I would always go in with what I know is working and do it better. I would travel light, I would have the minimum of gear, um, I, you know, I would have a flask rather than camping equipment, I wouldn't be taking my brolly, I'd be taking a barrow if possible, so I want to be mobile, you're fishing for a bite, so you know, you don't want loads of gear, but you want to be in a position where you've got a surface rod with you, you've got um, a bottom fishing rod with you, you know, so you want to be, have, cover the options, but you need to be mobile, yeah. so research, do what's working, do it a little bit better, but be able to cover the options. Certainly surface fishing, if it's allowed. Most people don't surface fish, so that's that is always it. I, you know, I always take a few riser pellets or, or um, slickers. Even if there's nothing, even if you're not using them, just fire a few out, you'd be amazed. Even in the middle of winter, all of a sudden you get carp. Really? Taking them off the top. And it's almost like, I call it like um, a non-cheating -cheeky, location aid, because those fish will come up, at this time of year I think they're higher in the water than we imagine and I find it easier to get them up two or three feet than to actually fish a zig at the right depth so it, if they're up on the surface you know they're there so yeah that's that's what I would do at this time of year. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah. Uh, going on to zig fishing though, yeah. do, do, you fix, fix, uh, do you fish fix zigs or adjustables? Uh, I'm not very good at zig fishing, I, I do fish zigs but to be honest I'm not I'm not really good it would be wrong of me to say I was a good zig angler I'm a good surface angler yeah thank you Brian Scholes <laughs> and I'm good on the bottom but I have to say that area t but when it's when it's six foot and all six foot and under which a lot of our local waters are they'll go down but once you're fishing in like 10 11 12 foot then zigs are up there my problem with zigs is and it's it's like one of those things you take with you 
when I was fishing probably in the 90s and noughties, there was a couple of waters where you could actually see the fish and you'd have a zig, I don't know, six foot off the bottom with two feet above it and you'd see the fish swim round it and just completely ignore it and that. I know they don't always do that but that completely did my head in. Yeah. And I know they do that on the bottom anyway but I'm like, oh, I'm not a good zig angler so. Yeah, well, I'm not my, my first experience of zig fishing, can you remember? Oh, Askin Lake. Oh right, wow. I just yeah. bought an adjustable, quarter set I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cast out but the bailout slipped so it slipped on and the lead smashed my zig float to bits before yeah. I even first used Done. it. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. all I needed, that's all yeah, I needed. But, yeah, I think, you know, you, you watch zig anglers at linear places like that, and it's like a matchman. You, they, they've got three out there, one's two foot off the top, one's four foot off the top, one's six foot off the top, and they're constantly adjusting them. The only way to become a good zig angler is just to take zigs fishing with you. You used to do that at Mezingham Sands in the winter when it was really cold. I used to take two rods, no bottom bait, just zig fishing, and it's it's a real leap of faith because you are putting your, uh, your faith in one tactic, and that's the way to do it because every half an hour you're letting it up a foot like we would recast the bottom bait to the left or the right you're popping it up a foot you're changing the colors that's the only way to become as good zig angler yeah. is just to take zig rocks it, it, again it's just not for me yeah. but it's, it's it's a good tactic but a lot of my waters it's not not really useful because there's too much weed you yeah, know uh, they're, they're very shallow there's too much weed and there's a lot of bird life I think they really are limited to certain waters. I do know that the fish are certain heights in the winter, but when it's a shallow water, you can often find areas of depth that you can catch them in on the bottom. So yeah, yeah bit of a, get the bit noses of, down. Yeah, a bit of a cop out, but uh, <laughs> to be honest, that's a cop out. <laughs> well, we covered it anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you spent much time fishing clay pond then, Julian? No, I did in the in the late eighties, early nineties. So that was like. How did you find that as a water then? Um, challenging, not because of the fish, but because of the anglers. It was like, uh, there was a lot of fish coming and going in those days, and it wasn't really my kind of fishing. But the clay pond had some good fishing. It's certainly yeah. m mid, mid to upper 20s in, in the probably late 80s, early 90s. Not that they all originated there, but yeah. it, it wasn't, you know, and it did happen in the 80s. It, it, it's, it was wrong, and it's wrong to do it now, but in the 80s, a lot of waters were stopped around here from other waters like Drax Pond yeah. you know was originally had I think about a dozen carp in it which my friend Eric stopped legally in the 70s and then uh, lads at Three Lakes moved fish the little stunty ones into Drax somebody else got permission from a farmer and you know a lot of waters in this era were stopped by illegal fish movement but it was around the country so there was a lot of that going on nowadays there's, there's, there is absolutely no excuse for it. i mean there was no excuse for it then but there is no it's expense disease in those days when people yeah. move fish nobody thought about diseases it yeah. was just like you move fish it's wrong to move them if it's not allowed but nowadays if you move fish it's like you know you're transferring disease as well so yeah it was a challenging time at the, the clay ponds i'll be looking over my shoulder because i was a local lad you know i was a selby lad and they were donny lads <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was it was like that in the 80s and 90s different world uh, yeah well fair play obviously i, I only ask you that it's because it, it's it's our most local water that we we fish a lot yeah um, it's a, yeah, it's a totally different water now. You know? Challenging water. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not an easy water. It's no, a challenging it's water. There's some good. There's some really good fish in it, and it's um, you know it's uh, it's one of our local waters. It doesn't get a lot of publicity. There's Absolutely. a lot a lot of waters. It, it's quite secretive around here, more than anywhere else. I mean, <laughs> you know, I know a lot of waters around here that everybody calls different names. People don't talk about. The owners don't want any publicity. <laughs> and really, this area, I suppose, it's because we've not got. We've not got the amount of waters that are down south in the Midlands that a lot of waters are very, very either oversubscribed, no publicity. You know, you can't blame people. Yeah, certainly I can think of waters probably uh, six miles from here that have got upper 30s that are dead man's weighing list, dead man's shoes. Yeah. And that even I won't get in. Yeah. The, well, the thing everyone wants for is don't they? Yeah, yeah, everyone yeah. wants absolutely. Don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you wait that? What's the, what is that? This is a quick fly round. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a few questions for you, Julian. We're just going to reel them off, and you yeah. just answer which one you prefer. Yeah. So, uh, 
Tea or coffee? Tea. Ronnie rig or multi rig? Multi rig, <laughs> of course. Laughter or pop up? Pop up. Spod or PVA? Uh, PVA. Uh, we've got front drag or free spawn? Oh, front drag. I, I, I can't understand why anybody has bait runner. It's just <laughs> like, it's crazy. There's, there's no advantage to bait runner. It's front drag always. Yeah, this is a good one. I think I know what he's going to say this time of year, but Wally's or boots? Um, for me, I would have to wear moon boots, only because I get a suffer with cold feet oh. in the winter. So, Ski-Tex ski light boots, are they weigh less than trainers, and they've revolutionised my cold feet. <laughs> so, it's, I, it, it's, if I could get away with boots, normal trainers, I would do, or good trainers, but it's Ski-Tex light to keep my feet warm. Um, mirror carp or common carp? Mirror, because I, if there's one common and a thousand mirrors, that common will find its way on my own. <laughs> mirror carp, mirror. <laughs> Anything other than a common. Same as I catch a lot of commons yeah. as well. This is something we think uh, you might appreciate, Julian. Uh, Iron Maiden or Metallica? Uh, I am Maiden, Adrian. I am Maiden. <laughs> Although, I mean, I'm not an old school Metallica fan. I love the Black Album. I mean, Thrash. I was more of a hair metal than thrash metal, so I didn't get thrash metal, but I thought the Metallica Black Album was one of the best albums of all time, although your traditional Metallica album, will get, Metallica fan will go, well, oh, that's not Metallica. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's Maiden, it's Maiden. Fair play, yeah. fair play. Um, following on for the music, we've got a guitar or bass. Uh, <laughs> guitar. Guitar. Yeah, yeah, I thought you might say that, the old six string. Yeah. Uh, well, this is a good one. I'm hoping you're going to know. Well, I'm sure you do now. Uh, slash or Kirk Hammer? Oh, Slash. Slash, Slash. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, Kirk Hammer does a great job, but Slash is more bluesy, traditional, my kind of a, yeah, yeah. yeah. But Saul Hudson all the time. You've enjoyed it last night. There were a band on in, in Norton Club and uh, they, they, they did a bit of Guns N' Roses. You'd have enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I've met Slash. Once or twice, and he's the nicest bloke going. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Real, just nice, oh. real nice bloke, real friendly. And it's, it's something I always say to people when people are comfortable with themselves, they're nice. Yeah. You know, nice people are nice people. They, they, you know, all the time in the world. Nice bloke, yeah. yeah. Great. Is he in that slash? I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see a picture anyway. I'll, I'll give you a picture you can use. Oh, Brilliant. Thank you. Um, That's who got me in, into guitar, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, we used to be in band back in the day. Yeah. 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 Um, Literally, that song, I remember going to school, guitar teacher, I said, can you teach me how to play uh, Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses? He said no, so I never went back. <laughs> <laughs> Dead right. <laughs> Guns N' <are> Roses. <no. laughs> Spring fishing or autumn fishing? Uh, spring for me. I think autumn is totally overrated. Yep. When we used to have a close season and fishing kicked off in June, the autumn fishing was great. But once fishing was allowed 24-7, once the bait quality got so good, once there were so many anglers, there's only so many times carp will get caught. Yeah. And I think by if you start in February, March, all year round, by the time it gets to September, October, I just think those carp on most waters, especially with the leaf fall, turn off. Uh, spring, definitely. Yeah, oh. definitely, yeah. Oh, that's good to know. That's that. fair yeah. Fair point as well. Yeah. 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 Bibb and brace or thermals? Uh, bib and, bib and, I love my thermals, but bib and brace stops that cold getting. Up your back. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Can't beat it. Can't. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Thermal blue suit, the poo suit. No, they're definitely not one of those. Not one of the blue suits. <laughs> um, buzz bars or pod? Oh, need. Um, I'm a single bank stick man. Um, I would have to say pod purely simply because. I can get it on landing stages, concrete, yeah. but I haven't used buzz bars since probably 92, 93. We already knew this, but we didn't want to have three questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's rock pod because it does give me an edge. What's the major advantage for single bank sticks for you? Is it just getting in different angles? Different or, angles, or, or, you can spread your rods about. Um, better angle, you're pointing, you can keep your rods out of the way, you know, you don't want two rods in the middle and trying to nick one pearl one when you're netting fish, you can spread so I'll have my rods at the side of the swim and I can net in the middle, you can space them out, I mean that goes back to the um, 90s when I fished three lakes and you could fish off the cut throughs then and so you could have one in one 
and you could have two in two uh, yeah. and obviously you needed to have single bank sticks and things but single bank sticks I don't see any advantage in having t and folding your reel handles for what I could understand if it's so tight but folding your reel handles I it's, think it's just a tackle tart thing that yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> somebody needs to tell the king he's not got any clothes on and does not look good <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, yeah, this is an interesting one for me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a cork man. Cork, cork or abbreviated? I'm a cork man, yeah, I'm yes, a cork yeah. man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't beat it, can you? No, no, it takes me back to the... Uh, uh, it's funny enough on this one, when I was a kid, that my first fish, and I used to have little six-foot rods, and I saw in Bennett's of Sheffield what looked like a beautiful cork handle. My mum and dad ordered it for Christmas. Got it out and it was a plastic handle. <laughs> I was like, how would you tell your mum and dad that that is? It's gone from the best Christmas present in the world to the worst Christmas present in the world. Thanks. Yeah, no, but it wasn't their fault. Was, so it's caught, always caught. Absolutely, yeah. agreed, yeah. agreed. Oh, the, the, oh, see, this is uh, an interesting one, isn't it, really? Yeah, this is the final one for yeah. you. Uh, Mark well, might. Yes or no? <laughs> uh, no, because I've never really had any. So, um, yeah. No, I've never had Marmite. So, um, oh, but I think the same, you know, it's, it, I've never had any Marmite, so no, it's I'm mar marmalade, honey, but not Marmite. <laughs> I'm hoping you going to say yes so we can pull a face to the camera. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Beef paste, but not Marmite. Oh, no, yes, yes. <laughs> Brilliant. So the next question we've got for you, Julian, is we have plenty of waters around. Could you tell us a bit of history behind the local name waters you've fished yourself over the years? Oh wow, yeah, yeah, that goes back. Um, I suppose I've been lucky to fish what I... In the past we used to call them circuit waters because it was a circuit anglers would travel around because there was so few waters that were big fish waters it was like a circuit of water so if you fished A you went to B, went to D, went to, so it was a circuit of waters that were called circuit waters so for me the circuit waters I fished obviously have been Drax, Three Lakes, Motorway, Tylery, Tyrum, uh, you know that, that those are the, the yeah. what I would say local local ones and what would happen is after you'd finish with one water you would go back to it about four or five years afterwards and the carp had grown probably three four five six pound heavier so you know that's and then certain waters click with you and certain yeah. waters didn't so Drax which I fished in the 84 85 86 could never catch a 20 pounder there because there weren't any 20 pounders in there yeah. despite people saying there were <laughs> there weren't 20 pounders in there the best I ever was 19 12 so then I went to the Tylery, which is, um, in those days it was known as East Yorkshire, then it became Humberside, I think it might be back to East Yorkshire, yeah. and I'm not quite sure, but my second fish there was a, a 20 pounder, and I realised that it's actually the water you fish, the same tactics, but you, you have to have the fish in the water to start with, yeah. so I fished Tylery for a few years, but I wanted to catch a 30 pounder, there was no 30, I, no there weren't any 30 pounders in there, the best was 27, 28, uh, I went to motorway and then caught the motorway fish at just over thirty pounds. And you know, and by the time I'd finished there and went back to Drax, those fish were mid twenties. So then I went back to Three Lakes and those it's fish were thirty. Yeah. It's a circle. Right. And I've always been one of those people that you can fish where you want. So if somebody says you shouldn't fish there because you've always fished there, it doesn't make any difference what if other people. It. Yeah. it makes no difference what other people say about your fishing. If you want to fish one water for the rest of your life, it doesn't make any difference. If you enjoy it, yeah. don't fish one water for the rest of your life and then say, well it's crap here, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't catch a 30 pounder. Yeah. But if you find something you're happy with, then do it. But round here I would say there's probably at least 20 waters that you could circulate round and be very happy with. But oh, yeah, all, all those waters, those waters were the premier waters in the, that you had to get in. But now, you can catch 20, 30 pounders around here. Not easily, but there are lots of waters that hold 20 and 30 pounders and bigger that used to hold singles and doubles. So we yeah. are blessed around here. Yeah, yeah, yeah I suppose we are. Yeah, but a lot of places nowadays are becoming club waters and syndicates, that's the only problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, yeah, that's what I would say is you've always got to look to the future. So yeah. don't just think about this year. Get your names down on waiting lists. Yeah. And every year, don't just put your name down in 2020 and then in 2020 say, I haven't heard, and the bloke goes, well, every year we, if anybody doesn't contest us back, you're off the list. So to me, you want to be chasing up your permits. And, you know, if the permits get 
if, if the permit is from the 1st of April, then I would definitely be checking up in March every year to make sure I was on the list. And I would definitely check it up on the 2nd of April because we get so many people put the names down on waters. And then when it said, when somebody says you've got to pay you 150 quid, they're like, ah, oh, maybe not. Yeah. And you want to be so every water that I'm in, I'm always chasing up just before yeah. and just after to make sure I'm on the waiting list. Yeah. So that's a thing that most people make the mistake. They put the name down and then they don't bother chasing it up, you know. Yeah. That, so that's a big mistake that people make. Mm. Good tip to be fair. Yeah, it's a yeah. good tip. Very good tip. Three Lakes Carp. Which, which Three Lakes is that? Sorry, Joe. Three Lakes near Selby. Ah, uh, right. Uh, yeah, Three not, Lakes Carp Syndicate near Selby, which a lot of people. I used to fish there in the 80s and early 90s when it was three separate lakes. Yeah. Car lake three was the Carp Lake. Lake two was a sort of the unknown quantity. It was a bit of course, bit of carp, and Lake one was the Match Lake. So Lake three had 10 swims on it. The carp in there in those days went to probably uh, 25, 26, 27 pounds. Now, if you went in winter, there wasn't many people fishing there. But once the first fish started getting caught, and once it got to April, it was rammed. You'd have 11 people in 10 swims. It was that bad. So I would always go February, start in February, maybe catch me fish in March. And then by the time it got to April bank holiday, it was like rammed, there's no way I was, it was like World War Three. I, <laughs> I remember one year I had, I had a couple of high 20s, 27, 12, 27, 4, in the early 90s, that was big fish, and the owner said to me, in town, I bumped into him in town, he says, I haven't seen you for a month or two, I says, to be honest Paul, I cannot fish there when there's like 11 people fishing 10 swims with three rods on, and those fish used to turn off. And he says, well, how can I persuade you to fish it? Well, I didn't want to have an exclusive swim or any of that old rubbish. I said, well, have you ever thought of turning it into a syndicate? And he says, I haven't. I said, why don't you knock all three lakes into one lake and make it a syndicate? So we discussed how much he earned from it over a year. I mean, that would ruin his wife. used to have to cycle around, chase up day tickets. People would come late, leave early to save paying for it. <laughs> typical Yorkshire. Typical Yorkshire. Yeah, yeah, typical Yorkshire. Yeah, yeah. So in the end, we, he told me what he earned. And I said, well, I think I can get 40 people paying £400 a year, which is 16 grand. So that's 16 grand in your hand, 1st of February. You don't need to worry about it. I'll run it. Um, and what I didn't want to do is having 40 people on a water that probably had probably 25 swims. So it was one week on, one week off yeah. from the 1st of March to the 1st of October. October and then from October onwards you could fish all the time so it meant you got 32 weeks fishing for 400 quid so for a big fish so he knocked it through and all of a sudden that was a joy to fish so from 1992 to 96-97 I ran it as the syndicate which was great and it you know most Yorkshire anglers that you know of Holmesy, Skiddy, all of those guys have fished there and caught very big carps. Now, that was that was one of the local ones. So I was proud of that. Now Roger Hind runs it, and it's um it's now two the back two lakes of syndicate, the front lakes day ticket. But well, I, I was proud of that. Oh. Tylery obviously was one of the waters I fished in the 80s and 90s, and it's funny the fish I caught at sort of 14 to 26 pounds were being caught at sort of 25 to 38 pound but unfortunately that got predated by otters it's such a big yeah, water you c it's owned well it's, it's leased by hull so it's owned by the sand factory so you can't ever put a fence around it but that was one of the local tire motorway pond of course next to the m62 which the whole club own i have 30 pound from them again that's just starting to come to its into its, its producing carp now to mid 30s wow uh drax of course that was the first lake i fished that of course now is dead man's shoes or no publicity, but as I'm not I'm, I'm not a member, I can talk about it. Um, that's got carp to probably 45. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so that's you know that's that that's a good water, but you just it's a what I mean, you might be able to get a one rod day ticket, but again that's a, a water that holds really big carp. But there are plenty of name waters around here, but. If you want to catch a big cup, you just want to catch a big cup, there's loads of places. But around here, there's lots of places for doubles, 20s and 30 pounders. Yeah, absolutely. Which, I mean, it's, there's always a, an ideology that it's harder in, up north, isn't it? Than it, than it is harder up north, but there's less pressure. 
Yeah. You know, I know a lot of places down south that will have 10 people on today, yeah. whereas up here will have one, yeah. if that. So the bigger carp, the reason the bigger carp down south, one of the reasons is purely amount of bait. Yeah. Up here, Yorkshire anglers, notorious for tightness with bait. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed down south, they go with five kilo of bait. What they haven't used, they're firing. Yeah. Up here, they take five kilo of bait and they come back with 4.9. <laughs> they take back, I mean, the Yorkshiremen must love the ready made. They take it back, they don't have to keep it frozen. And that is a big difference is the amount of bait we use up here compared to the amount of bait that is used in Essex, Kent. They use far more bait, there's more people. And it, 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 a lot of the big water, a lot of the big weights down there, down to bait without a shadow of it. Up here, we have not. A lot of anglers don't know how to use bait properly, whereas down south they do. Yeah, we are tight. <laughs> we are, yeah. <laughs> Careful. I'm glad to see that you lads don't have the heating on as well. <laughs> I'm after my own heart. You said you weren't going to mention that. No, no, no. This, this, this is perfect temperature. This is perfect temperature. So, no, I can't see my breath, so it's probably a little bit warm, to be honest. Just a little bit warm. <laughs> Take a long off fire, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm on it. Would you prefer to drop a lead or keep a lead on? Um, if I, I don't want to drop leads unless I have to drop them, there's no doubt that in weed and snags, that once you get rid of the lead, the fish is more likely to, if you break off, shed shed the rig, which is safer. And in weed and weed and uh, snags, if you play a fish in weed. And you drop the lead there's you've not got that great big ball of so i don't drop the lead unless there's weed about in heavy weed i will always drop the lead yep. because people say don't drop the lead there's nothing dropping the lead of course is a pollution but there's nothing worse than dropping a lead tubing leader yeah. hook yeah. pulling the carp's mouth off so i don't want to drop a pound lead but it's far safer to drop the lead when you hook the carp than it is to hope that the whole thing comes in. It's the ball of, you always get the ball of weed built up round the lead, not round the hook and not round the lead. It's always the thing. So only drop the lead if there's weed, weed and I mean some substantial weed or snags. You know, yeah. you don't want to be, and it does, once the, once the fish is up in the water, it is less likely to snag you up and pick up things. So I do drop the lead, but not all the time. No, no, no. O only if I'm in weed. Oh, fair play. Yeah. yeah. If you're that worried about it, don't go fishing. I mean, we, we are sticking hooks in them. Yeah, yeah. We are putting food in them, and I think there has to be. We've all got our own moral compass. I don't like bait, but I understand some people do. I feel uncomfortable yeah. about that. But I stick hooks in carp. So if I was really that worried about the fish, I would never stick a hook in a carp. It's right. got to be, is it cruel to have a dog? Is it cruel to have a dog in a lead? You know, I think we all have to have our own moral compass about where we are. Yeah, yeah. And I, I am happy to stick hooks in carp. And I'd rather use a heavy line and stop it getting in the snags and drop the lead than use a very fine line, a tiny hook and snap off. I think it's common sense to me. Yeah, yeah and it's, I mean, it's, there's just nothing worse than snapping off and feeling that guilt, is there? No, I think, I think most problems, big issues, is they don't use strong enough line. Most of the line I use is £15 or £20. If yeah. you're float fishing or fishing on the surface, then £15 or £20 is too heavy. It spooks the carp. But I cannot understand why people use 8, 10, 12 pound line for fishing on the bottom. Yeah. 15 pound line takes, you know, or 20, I use 20. Up to about 60 yards, I'll use 20 pound. It sinks better, you get a better pull on the fish, it's less likely to snap, it takes a bad knot, it takes abrasion resistance. Most people who snap off and fish have used line that's too light. And also, they don't change it, which is. It's bizarre. Mm. A thousand yards of the best quality line. Most lines from Nash, Corda, um, ESP are 20 pounds for a thousand yards of line. And yet people will say, well, uh, once a year I might charge. Why? It's costing. You know, mm. I change my line three or four times a year and it costs me maybe. £50 in line a year, yet people will spend £50 on booze, fags, and driving there. People will say, oh no, I'm not changing my line. Line is in the water, it gets abrasion. I would say, change your line every three or four months. It's so cheap. Yeah. A thousand yards of line at 
what would we use on a spool nowadays? 200 yards at most? You're not casting 200 yards. Yeah. You are getting probably, you could do your line twice on three rods for £20. Yeah. So it's probably going to spend £30 on line yeah. a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much do you spend on bait, fuel, Oof. tags? Too much. Well, not, not heating. Heating. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We don't spend any money on heating. No, come on. <laughs> Put a jumper on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, you know, spend your money on line, yeah. line, sharp hooks, forget about loads of bait, forget about um, new bank sticks and buzzers and new bivvies, spend it on line and hooks, you know, that, those are the ones that you should spend your money on, yeah. lines and hooks. I think uh, we're going to have to ask you about this one. now, Julian, so you've obviously kindly fetched in some... Oh yeah, memorabilia, memorabilia. Yes, memorabilia. <laughs> so it's this. funny enough, my, my missus, anything my missus buys for the house, Love hearts, I was referred to as Tat. <laughs> she refers to this as Tat too. Oh, more Tat for your collection. It's my memorabilia, which of course is a woman's Tat. Absolutely. Well, I don't really see that on the camera. This is Julian's trophy, North Humberside Trophy Cap Society Regional Catch of the Year, 93 94. Year we were made, pal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, tell yeah. us a little bit more about that. Then. Oh, yeah, I mean, I've never been. Um, I think it's nice to be recognised for your achievements in fishing. Absolutely. And um, that was the, the first year. Um, well, it's actually, that was quite a very important, it was an important thing in my fish. It changed me as a fisherman. I always wanted to, I always thought that more I caught, the more I'd be recognised as an angler. And I think we all do that. When we start, you know, I want to catch us, but I want people to recognise me. And um, that was the year where I really, really fished hard. Um, I did, I can't remember how many nights, but that was the year I caught 45 20 pounders in Yorkshire on a, literally, virtually all an overnighters. Which is a, an achievement in itself. That was a lot of fish <laughs> and I remember... Is that what you were talking about in the BK yeah, Guide Yeah, that's right. Uh, I remember, cat, and it, it taught me a lesson, because I remember, in the, it was the days of slide film. Yeah. Everything was slide film. And I remember catching the last two, because the year before I caught 43 20s in a year, and then I caught 45 and I thought, well, this is ridiculous, I'm going to have to catch 50 next year, <laughs> to, to, you know, to do what I need to do. And I caught the last two and it was November and it was really, really cold. And it was self-timers as well. Caught these two, put them back, went to work. Slide film was used up in an envelope, post it off, <laughs> wait for it to come back. And I remember getting the slides and a projector, put them up and I thought, I don't even remember catching those fish. I know I caught them, but they... I didn't remember looking at them and I thought well, this is ridiculous I'm now fishing for numbers I'm not remembering it I'm not although fishing was okay I thought well next year I'm gonna to have to catch 47 or 50 and it was a massive because I thought actually who am I doing this for yeah. I, I don't even remember catching those two fish I remember they were just a picture I thought I just don't remember them so that taught me then it's not I stopped doing it for other people yeah. I did it for me yeah. And yeah, I did do it for the people because I wanted to be recognised. I wanted to, and believe you me, anybody who poo poos that, you get a lot of old school anglers say, "Oh, it's ridiculous." They all had that moment. I'm say, yeah. I think we're all guilty of that. Aren't we? we want the biggest, the most, whatever. Yeah. They want to be recognised. Ain't nobody on social media. Ain't nobody who's written books. Ain't nobody been on film. Ain't no. They all poo poo it. But there was a stage at there, every single one of them. You read the books, they all wanted to be famous, known, catch the biggest. Yeah. If they didn't, you'd never hear about them. I know a couple of anglers, Secret John Holt, Steve Olcott, people like that who don't, who've caught more big carp than your heroes and my heroes. They don't want people, they don't need people to know about That's their thing. Yeah. You know? But I realised then that actually, I'm not doing it for me, I'm doing it for other people. And after that, I couldn't give a toss what anybody else thinks about my fishing. It's funnily enough, I was watching a video not too long ago um, with Mick Brown. And yeah. He said exactly the same thing, that you know, he was guilty of wanting the biggest, the most, and now he just does it for pleasure, he don't care if it's £4, £24. It's, it does not want to change my life, so I, I, I would never tell, tell people not to do it, because you want to have, it's whatever makes you tick. And, if it gets you out of bed to 
I, I need to catch more. If that gets you out of bed, that gets you out of bed. Yeah. You've got to find out what gets you out of bed to go fishing. Because the hardest thing about carp fishing is actually doing it. Yeah. It's easy to be on your on your keyboard. Type, oh, it's uh, uh, June. I'll be out there doing it. Hardest thing is to do it on the eighth of January when it's snowing yeah. or it's freezing and it doesn't <laughs> look like a bed. That you need to find out what gets you out of bed. Yeah. Now, for Tommy Pickering, my friend. What gets him out of bed is winning a match. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether he's fishing with two people or 80, whether he catches one ounce and it gets him out of bed. So I now know what gets me out of bed to go fishing. Whereas what got me out of bed to go fishing those days was I wanted to get the most Yorkshire 20s on overnights in a year. Mm. But it's different things now. So yeah, yeah, that, that, was a, that, was a, that was an important moment in two ways. One, to win the trophy. And then two, to actually think, actually, I'm not need to do that anymore. Yeah. So what would you say is your biggest passion that you get out of it at the moment then? I enjoy it. I, I think, well, it's two things. Number one is I actually enjoy fishing. Yeah. I love car fishing. Catching them is a byproduct. I'll try my very hardest. If I catch them, I catch them. If I don't, I don't. And actually, I actually like being out there. I, yeah. I like being out there. I only judge my results on that water on that day. So if I'm going fishing with a mate and he catches six and I catch one, I will analyse it in my brain. Was it that he was on all the fish or was he trying harder than me? But I only compare my results to what else. So the fact that Tom Maker has caught three 30 pounders from Linear on the same day, I don't compare to my four 14 pounders from Sugar Mills on the same day. It's not the same water, it's different yeah. water. Yeah. So I only look at where I'm fishing on the day and what if so if I'm gonna walk and everybody else is catching loads and I'm not catching many, I'll have a word with myself. Yeah. <laughs> but I won't have a word with myself because somebody else has caught three thirty pounders from linear, because there'll be some poor sod up in Scotland who went on a bike for two months because it's crap. Don't tell us about Scotland. <laughs> That's what I mean. So <laughs> four week blanks. <laughs> I've, I've done that a lot though, yeah. but you should only compare your results yeah. to those on the water on the day. I don't ever judge my results against other people. I use other people as a barometer on that day, how they're fishing. On the same water. On the same water on the same day. I don't go, well, he had three 19 pounders in June yeah. and I've only had two 14 pounders on the 3rd of January. You've got to be realistic. Yeah. Other people are a good barometer of how you are fishing, providing they're fishing that water on that day. Yeah. Not the week before or the week after. So I don't always compare my results to other people, but I do if it's the same water on the yeah, same day. Yeah. If they're in the swim on the snag, there's only one set of snags, and they catch seven one day and I catch one, often you can say, well, a lot of the fish are in the snags at this time of year, reads, so I can understand it. But generally, what's he doing different to me? He's fishing halfway out. You can always learn something. I've seen this before. If you chuck out in the middle, that's where they all are. He drops short and he catches fish after fish. I think, hmm, he's doing something that yeah. I'm not doing. Yeah. The, the better, as an angler, the more experience you've got, the quicker you pick up on things. So, what I might not have picked that up when I was 25, I might have thought, well, just look. Yeah. But nowadays, I don't put anybody else's catches down to look. If he's using a bright orange bottom bait and I'm using a bright orange pop up and he's catching three more times than me, I don't think, well, let's look. I think, get that shot off, get that, get that bottom bait off. Yeah. So, the, the best anglers learn quicker. They, they don't put anybody else's fish down to look. They watch what they've done and they think, right, what can I learn from that? I can yeah. learn from everything. It's a good tip, that, to say. Fair play, yeah. yeah. It's easy to get jealous, isn't it, and say, oh, let's look that. I'm envious. <laughs> I'm <laughs> envious all the time. I am, en I am never not envious. When somebody catches and I'm not catching, I'm, a I'm not jealous. Yeah. I'm envious. Yeah. And that's a the big difference. Envy will make you try harder. Jealousy eats away at you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous of your age. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, right. I was your age. How old are you now? 28. So 28, that was 30 years ago. So take 30 off that. So it'll be 19, 1992. Yeah. So I was just about to set up three legs. So I'm envious of your age. Yeah. Well, we're envious of your car fishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose, I mean, looking at some other bits and bobs that you fetched to show us, and Julian, um, we've got your Three Lakes Cap Syndicate here from 1993, again. Yeah, that was, that was when I set it up as a syndicate, and believe you me, that did not make me the most popular man in Yorkshire, <laughs> because obviously I was turning a day ticket... Into a syndicate. Yeah. Into a syndicate. Yeah. 
so I was very popular with 40 anglers and I was very unpopular with probably about 400. But it's funny that the 400 that I wasn't happy with, when they became one of the 40, I was their best yeah, man. Um, and, you know, that, that, you know that, that, was, that was amazing, you know, to, to turn what has become one of the... What, well, at that time, it was definitely one of the North's best, best waters in the 90s. Oh, yes. So I had no advantage over anybody else. I didn't get paid for it. Um, it was, you know, it was great to see a water turn from a horrible you know, litter leaving, yeah. World War Three day ticket into a syndicate. And I understand why syndicates become syndicates because with a syndicate, you could chuck people off and they never come back again. Day ticket anglers, I'm not saying all day ticket anglers, but there's a big day ticket angler, day ticket mentality. Yeah. It's the McDonald's, you know, what? Well, if I get chucked off, it's, I've only lost me ten quid, you know, and yeah, yeah it's so that yeah, that was a proud moment to run the three lake, three lake syndicate days. I mean, look, looking down there as well, some great fish, uh, all quite a few over thirty. Yeah, that, that back that, in nineties. That back in the nineties, at one time there was probably ten over thirty, thirty-five pound, which was a lot of fish in the days. But every water has its cycle, so it, it you know did really well to the early noughties and the old fish died and it's come through again so you know things have cycles you know they, they come back into fashion absolutely yeah. so the last question we've got for you today Julian is what does the future hold for yourself regarding your fishing and is there any aspect of angling in the industry you want to pursue that you haven't already Ooh, hi, ah, cranky. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think two years ago, you used to plan in the future. You used to say, well, I want to do this in two years. I'm going to do that. I think the pandemic yeah. has made us focus short term. Yeah. You, you're having to, well, I'm, I'm going to do this this week. I'm going to, or, or today, I'm going to do this before five o'clock before Boris has his bit. Locks so, us down. Locks in, well, <laughs> so I'm very lucky in that as a kid, I had long term aspirations. It was various things. And as you get older, they, your aspirations get smaller and smaller because you achieve things. So what you wanted to achieve when you were 15 was way out in the future. But when you achieve it, it gets nearer. So I don't have many major aspirations. I, I always wanted to give more back than I took from fishing. And I, I feel I've done that. Okay. I always wanted to write books and I wanted to I wanted to meet my famous rock stars and I've done all that. Absolutely. So, yeah, so, about that. so, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think without being funny, I, I've achieved all I wanted to do. I just want the, and the biggest achievement now is to keep enjoying it for enjoying its sake. It's, I think some people, it becomes harder and harder because they need to catch a bigger carp or have more followers or have more Instagram people or make, I'm under no pressure to do that. Yeah. My, my only aspiration is to keep enjoying it as much tomorrow as I did today. And that, that's, that sounds a bit wishy-washy, but it's when you actually really enjoy something, to keep enjoying it at the same level is is it's a lot harder than you imagine so i still want to get up in the morning and want to go fishing yeah. i still want to enjoy catching a 17 as much as a 27. Yeah. i still want to enjoy doing my facebook posts i still want to enjoy helping other people that's um, what i'm going to say it's cl clearly evident that you like passing on the knowledge yeah, yeah and you know yeah. you go into a lot of detail on your facebook as well yeah i've always enjoyed I, i've always wanted to make um, fishing easier for other people, yeah. you know, and uh, carp fishing is not rocket science, believe you me, carp fishing is not rocket science, it's time, it's the water you're fishing on, it's experience and it's drive, yeah. you, you, those four, even if you have experience, time, right water, if you can't be asked to get out of bed, they all work in unison. So I could be retired, I could have access to all the good waters, I could have 35 years of carp fishing experience, I could wake up in the morning and say, do you know what, I can't be asked to go fishing anymore. It's ruined it. So yeah. luckily I'm at that time, when I have the time, I've got the experience, and I've still got the passion to get up and go fishing for 15 pounders in the winter or 25 pounders in the summer. And that's a lot harder than you imagine, because a lot of people can't get out of bed unless it's a bigger fish or more followers or yeah. or it's for it's for the business or it's for a vlog or it's a blog it's never been a job for me so to me 
my simple passion is to enjoy it as much as I have always have done for it not to become a business um, and to see the year through because we don't really know with all this pandemic do we? Oh, yeah, very true. Yeah, no, very true. I'm very blessed so uh, hopefully, hopefully you've all enjoyed that today. Yeah, no, no we, we've loved really. it. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, being on the first Yorkshire Angler show. Yeah, I'm, I'm very honoured. You can only be. I was on the. I was in Cartwheel number one, so I was very honoured about that. <laughs> so you can only be the first. We can only be one first person, can't we? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's I'm, I'm honoured. You know, I'm honoured to be the first guest. Yeah, absolutely. It's been great to have you. And you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.